Hey family, this is Ricky here at Southwest Church, and I want to thank you so much for tuning in with us here at Southwest Online. Ours is a church that's nestled in the heart of the Coachella Valley in Southern California, just near Palm Springs. And we're so excited that we get to encourage you in the word of Almighty God. We are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we love discipleship. And in a few moments, we're going to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Just before we do that, just know that your gifts of generosity help us to do what God has called us to do, to tell you and to tell the world about the good news of Jesus. There's a couple of screens that are coming up that are give you instructions as to how you can be a part of the mission of this church by giving faithfully and generously as God leads you to give. As always, thank you so much for helping us help others. Welcome to Southwest Church. everybody, let's go ahead and hop right to it. If you got your Bibles handy, uh, why don't you open them to Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. We're taking it all the way through verse 24 as we pick back up in a new series of study that we have entitled Deeper, the Gospel of Galatians, walking through all the jots and tittles of these wonderful six chapters that were inspired for us and for God's church 2,000 years ago. We call it Deeper, the Gospel of Galatians. And our hope and my prayer for you is that upon the culmination of our study, you and I will be deeper in relationship with Jesus, that we'll be deeper in love with Jesus, that we'll be deeper in our growth, deeper in our wisdom, deeper in our commitment to Jesus, deeper uh, in our wisdom from Jesus, and deeper in our joy because of who Jesus is and what he is doing in our lives. I started this off a few days ago. Maybe you can check that out after you finish this message if you haven't seen it already. But to kind of help you wrap your mind around the letter of Galatians, let me beg the question, what then is the message of Galatians? I want you to check this out there on your screen. I think the ultimate message that Paul is laying out in the letter is this, uh, your salvation, your redemption, your forgiveness and approval, hear this now, Paul is arguing that it rests solely on what Jesus Christ has done for you, not on what you do for Jesus Christ. All in Galatians, Paul is basically saying that the gospel of Jesus is a gospel that is not founded on our works, but rather it is founded on God's grace in his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, one of the reasons we think that we need to, in the day and age we live in, walk through these truths about the good news of God's grace for 17 weeks is because too often believers tend to understand God's grace here, but they don't live like it here. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you you know that yes, God loves me, not on account of anything I do. I know that here, but we don't always live like it here. We believe something differently. And at the end of the day, I just feel like there's a default kind of reversion in our soul, right? Like we know that God loves me no matter what I do. God loves me because God loves me, but we'll kind of default and revert back to this religious connection with Jesus as opposed to this relational connection. Religious connection meaning that I I, I believe this lie that says Jesus loves me and is impressed with me when I'm having a better day on his behalf. So at the end of the day, what it means to believe in a gospel of grace is to be freed from the exhaustion of trying to believe that you have to heap up performance and accomplishments for God to love you. God already loves you because you are his child. So we got to hammer through this, right? Southwest Online, we got to do this because we don't really understand what the grace of God is. Pastor Robert Morris out of uh, 
Dallas, Texas, tells a story about a friend of his who was a Christian school teacher, right? Like this guy teaches at a Christian school, and he was trying to show forth how few Christians really understand what God's grace is. He's sitting down with his friend at lunch, and he says, hey, the grace of God is kind of like the oars on a boat. That's what God's grace is like. And Rob says to him, okay, go, go on with that. He says, yeah, the, the, the grace of God are like the oars on a boat. See, life is like this boat, but the current is drawing me to hell. That's the current. And, and so God's grace comes in like these oars. And, and the result is this. If I just keep rowing, I'll go to heaven. But if ever I quit rowing, I go to hell. So that's the good news of the grace is that I've got these oars to, to work my way out of hell into heaven. And Robert's looking at this and he's listening to it and he says to his friend, well, the problem with your scenario is that in your construal of the gospel, it's no such thing as amazing grace. There's just an amazing you. And here's the problem with what you're saying you ain't all that amazing. You see, the good news of the gospel is that an amazing Savior came down for us 2,000 years ago and brought hope and fulfillment and redemption to unamazing people. That's the message of Galatians. Now, we kind of inch ahead as Paul is about to tell his life story to the Galatian churches to remind them that this gospel that we speak to you today is not based on anything that man could have construed, but it all came from the generous heart of God. Let's go now to our text and let's read now as we walk and worship together. Thanks so much for being with us at Southwest Online. Paul is writing to the church and he says, verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Verse 11, he says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you've heard from my, of my formal life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart, Paul says, before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Kilikia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, I love this, y'all. He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 through 24, I have read from the greatest book ever written, and I bear witness this day that all of its words are true. Amen? Amen. Let's get started, shall we? Uh, when you uh, look at our passage, it becomes obvious that what we've just read is an essentially uh, Paul's autobiography. Uh, it is essentially Paul's autobiography, which of course reminds me of a wonderful autobiography that was written by an evangelist named David Ring, and the book is entitled um, Boy Born Dead. Uh, boy born dead. In the book, uh, David Ring tells his own story as to how he was born back on October 28, 1953 in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, however, tragically, he was literally born dead, uh, uh, stillborn, uh, completely lifeless there on the delivery table. Young infant David Ring was uh, born dead. Dead. Now the scene is one of pain and tears and agony and anguish as for 18 minutes, 
uh, David Ring lay lifeless on the delivery table. Uh, the doctors are encouraging his heartbroken mom. The nurses are getting ready to process his death, and they're getting ready to fill out death certificates and all of these tragic things, and then it happened. All of a sudden, this little baby started coughing. This little baby started crying, and this little baby kept on crying, and this little baby kept on coughing. David Ring had come back to life. It was a literal miracle. But of course, they realized that 18 minutes without brain, without oxygen to his brain, would stricken him with cerebral palsy for the remainder of his life. He would live the rest of his years with this magnificent handicap. As if that wasn't enough, 11 years later, his dad tragically passed away. As if that wasn't enough, his mom tragically passes away, leaving now 14-year-old David Ring to suffer the trauma of orphanhood being passed around from family to family. As if that was enough, constantly he's ridiculed by classmates who made fun of the way he talked and the way that he walked. His depression was so severe that he invested most of his teenage years begging God to die. Uh, but then David Weidman came along. David Weidman was another kid who befriended David Ring and upon noticing his severe depression said to David, what you need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And history tells us on the 17th of April, 1970, David Weidman pulls David Ring kicking and screaming into a tent revival one night. And as the gospel ministered the good news that Jesus saves and Jesus heals and Jesus delivers, it was as in his soul what John Newton must have experienced when he penned those famous words, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, moved by the gospel. Young David Ring rushes the altar. He gives his heart and life to Jesus. He is experiencing the joy of newfound oneness with God. But as he's listening to the songs being sung, he begins to discern that the voice of God at the same time he was being saved was also being sent. And he hears the Holy Spirit whispering to him, son, I want you to go around the whole world and tell everybody about my good news. And this cerebral palsy teenager who's known nothing but struggle on his life begins to push back against Jesus. And he says and literally cries out the altar, but God, I have nothing to give. And then there was a pregnant pause when he heard the Spirit of the Lord saying to him, that's okay because I love working with nothing. Fast forward several years later, David Ring is now married with four kids. He preaches the gospel all over the world 275 times a year to audiences reaching well over hundreds of thousands of people each and every year. He said God's been so good to him that when he gets to heaven, that's gonna be the only question that he asks, God, why have you been so good to me? Our passage is another autobiography of another preacher who met that same Savior on a Damascus road. And I can imagine that Paul himself would have been looking back on the ruin that was his life, crying out to Jesus that day, but Jesus, I have nothing to give. And I'm here to tell you that the same Savior who told David Ring is probably the same Savior who told G Paul that day that I love working with nothing. And the good news of the gospel is that he still loves working with nothings today. I want to take a few moments to walk through this passage. And in so doing, I want to talk about how Paul's story is ultimately the gospel story that God wants to work out in each and every one of our lives. Table of contents for our time as we look through the autobiography of Paul is that Jesus pursues you. Jesus permeates you and Jesus repurposes you. I'd like to tag this text, a gospel story. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to share this good news that changed David Ring's life and changed the Apostle Paul's life, and it changed my life. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would inhabit this space with your presence and your spirit and call people to yourself. 
as we account, Lord God, for how greatly you moved in Paul's life. Move again in so many lives today to your fame and glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and kind of jump to it. And I think as we move throughout Galatians chapter 1, that, that one of the ways to better understand what Paul is saying is to first review what Paul has already said in the letter of Galatians. So let's kind of just look at uh, what Paul has said by way of review. For the next few minutes, I just want you guys uh, to think review. Now, one of the points we made when we started the series was that as Paul writes Galatians, that there's opposition here, that there is opposition here. Paul is writing to the churches in and around Galatia. Apparently, they are they are faltering spiritually. And one of the things we quickly realize is that they are spiritually faulting due large in part to the infiltration of this religious group, this group of false teachers called the Judaizers. The Judaizers, we call them Judaizers because of their insistence by saying that the gospel depended not just on Jesus, but on Jesus plus someone or something else. And for the something else, for the Judaizers, that was adherence to Judaism, the Mosaic law. They said Jesus was not good enough. You needed Jesus plus your own goodness to be saved. So to kind of summarize what they were teaching, look at this on screen so we can understand the Judaizers' heresy. They said salvation is not based on Jesus and what he's done for you. Salvation is based on you and what you do for Jesus. So you got to understand that before we move forward, because that's the whole crux of the letter. These churches would have heard that Jesus Christ is the only way, but now there are false teachers who are saying Jesus Christ plus another way. They're saying you got to keep Judaism. You got to keep up with the circumcisions. You got to keep up with the dietary restrictions. You got to keep up with the law. They said Jesus is a good start, but here we go. You need some oars that you can work your own way in. Now, What's the point of all this thus far? And this is what you need to feel about this. They're lying. (laughs) They're totally lying. This is directly in conflict with the heart of God. This was not what God said about the gospel. This is not what God said about the work of Jesus Christ. And so this is a complete heresy, which is why Paul writes this letter. They were completely off. A buddy of mine sent me a little snapshot of a commentator's note about the Judaizers and their infiltration of the churches of Galatia. And this commentator made the joke that if the Judaizers would have taught Sunday school music, the song would have went like this. Uh, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, but you are not. So let's just keep on circumcising and eating kosher meals, right arm, (laughs) left arm. They were completely off what Paul had taught, what Jesus had said about the nature of the gospel, that all you need to be saved and all you need to be whole and all you need to be completely fulfilled in your life is put your trust and faith in what Jesus has done for you, not in what you do for Jesus. So as we kind of continue on with this review, what then was Paul's response? It was don't listen to them. And some of you are watching today and you need to hear that because there's schools of thought or philosophies or there's some kind of default setting in your heart that is believing that you're better off when you're better off. No, 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 no. You are better off when you put your trust and faith completely in what Jesus has accomplished for you on the cross. Don't listen to them, Paul says. Why? Because they're making a revision of the gospel. And Tim Keller said that anytime you revise the gospel, you reverse the gospel. Anytime you revise the gospel, you reverse the gospel. Paul says once you edit it, it ain't it anymore. Notice our text, verse 6. Paul says that when you desert Christ and when you add anything to the gospel, he says you're turning to a different gospel. That anytime you edit it, it ain't it. Anytime when you add to it, it ain't it. Paul says you're turning to a different gospel. Let's kind of run down this trail a little bit, shall we, Southwest Online? Underline that word different. Uh, There were typically 
two Greek suspects uh, to denote contrast or imply the word different. Uh, the first option was the Greek word alas, but the second option was the Greek word heteros, alas and heteros. Now, alas means to be another of the same kind, but the Greek word heteros means to be another of a different kind. Guess what word Paul uses in our text when he says you're turning to a different gospel? You're right. It's heteros. You're turning to a different kind of the gospel altogether. Translation, anytime your heart believes that your worth and your esteem before God is based on Jesus plus your performance, Paul says it is a heteros gospel. It is not the gospel at all. Now, all of that review to kind of boil down to this big idea to make sure that we can understand well what Paul is doing with his autobiography today. Here's the big idea of Galatians chapter 1 verses 10 through 24. Your salvation is not based on anything human. That's the big idea of the passage. That's why you tuned in today to hear that that God told us to tell you that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It has nothing to do with any effort and any accomplishments of human beings whatsoever, including yourself, so much so that Paul would say in the previous uh, verses, even if I should preach something different to you, don't believe it because the gospel is this, Jesus loves you and gave himself for your sins. Your salvation is not based on anything human. Look at verse 16. Paul says, when, the, when, when he was pleased to reveal his son to me, he says, when I got that gospel, keywords, I didn't consult with anyone. I didn't consult with anyone. Underline that word, anyone. It's actually an unfortunate translation. The word anyone there is the Greek word sarx. Now, sarx is always used to speak of our flesh, our sinful flesh. When we translate verse 16 woodenly, it says, when Jesus Christ revealed his gospel to me, I didn't consult with flesh and blood. What's Paul saying? He's saying that your salvation has nothing to do with your flesh and blood. And that's good news because that means it has to be based on something that is altogether more worthy and more capable. And I'm come to tell you that that is Jesus Christ. Paul says, I didn't consult with flesh and blood. Now, why is it good news that my salvation doesn't have anything to do with flesh and blood, because if it's based on flesh and blood, it could be canceled by flesh and blood. If it's based on flesh and blood, it can then be diminished by flesh and blood. If it's based on flesh and blood, it can be sometimes up and sometimes down, sometimes on and sometimes off like flesh and blood. But I heard Peter saying, chapter 2, verse 16, that we have a more sure word. And what is the sure word that Paul speaks of in our passage? It is this, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. This is the good news of the gospel. That's what Paul has said. Let's, now let's look at what he's saying and what he's doing in our passage today. Now remember, he's working through this idea that salvation, okay, this defense, salvation is not based on anything human, okay? Your peace in Christ is not about, is not based on anything that humans say. It's, it's based on what God says. It's not even based on what you say. Hallelujah. It is based on what God said. And as long as God said it, you can depend on it. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in the telling of the story, that's what you need to feel in this autobiography, that Paul's just showing the Galatians that his gospel of grace could only have come about through the interactions of the divine, through God himself. There's no way that the gospel can be of human conceit. And to pound this point to the Galatians, he shows the divine origin and worthiness of the gospel as he recounts his own story. That's the whole idea. Now, Philip Ryken, uh, president of Wheaton College and a wonderful scholar, said that the, the, the letter of Galatians is neatly organized in biology, theology, and duology. 
he don't say duology. He says ethics, but I thought that would be funny. You know, do, do what you do. Okay. Uh, basically, he says that there's two chapters of Paul's story, two chapters of what we should believe as a result of Paul's story, and then two chapters as to how we should live out what we believe as a result of what God has done in the life of Paul and all believers. There's biology, there's theology, and there's duology. And here Paul is giving us his biology. Now, why is he doing it? Remember, he's under attack from the Judaizers. The Judaizers have been saying, hey, this Paul is not legit. Paul has distorted the message. That's not what the the, the apostles are saying up in headquarters. Paul has edited the gospel. It's not just Jesus. It's Jesus plus works. Paul is not a real capital A apostle. He's a lowercase a. Paul went to the master's class to get his his, his apostleship. Paul is, is getting this stuff from Wikipedia. It's discounted. And so to authenticate the gospel, Paul tells the credibility of his own story. And in so doing, he shows us how the gospel works itself out in our lives. What do we learn? First thing we learn is that in the gospel, it is Jesus who pursues you. It is Jesus who pursues you. Look at verses 11 and 12. He says, I have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He's, of course, talking about Damascus Road. Paul's on his way to kill Christians. And all of a sudden, the resurrected Jesus appears. It wasn't a vision. It was an encounter where Jesus himself saves Paul, redeems Paul, and calls him to mission to deliver the gospel to the Gentiles. And I'm here reminding you that this account underlines this truth in the gospel, that it is the gospel and it is Jesus who pursues you not the other way around. This is what I want you to hear. You don't happen to the gospel. The gospel happens to you. Jesus said in John chapter six, verse 44, that no man can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. Jesus is underlining that point. Friend, the gospel happens to you. You don't happen to the gospel. God God pursues you according and on account of his grace. You see, in the story, Paul saying, Galatians, I couldn't have made this up. There's no way because I was on my way to kill Christians, not to be one of them. He's basically testifying to the fact that I was headed in another direction. And what's crazy about my story, Paul would say, is that I thought I was actually doing a good thing. And what's the lesson is there? Even if we think we're doing good without Jesus, we're still bad. And it takes someone on the outside to do something on the inside of us. And that person is Jesus Christ. Verse 15, notice he says, but when he who set me apart before I was born, what's the lesson? Do you really think oars on a boat made any difference without God coming to pursue us and making the gracious decision that he was going to redeem us and save us and open our heart to him? Ricky, say it plain. I'm glad you asked. The gospel works not because you were thinking about God, but because God was first thinking about you. It's the good news of Jesus that he is thinking about us us. Paul is saying in my shaggy voice, it wasn't me. Okay. It was all God. We sing these songs, uh, which are beautiful and they touch our hearts, but sometimes they're theologically off. Uh, Songs like, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. And I love the picture of it because it's about God being the rescuer. But sometimes we make our relationship with Jesus look like we were just kind of struggling on our own and doing the best that we can to try to reach him. And then he throws out a rope and we're able to grab it and pull ourselves up. But that is not a biblical dependence depiction of our spiritual state before Christ. The Bible doesn't say we were swimming. The Bible doesn't even say we were sinking. The Bible says we were dead. Hallelujah. Dead. 
in our trespasses. We were dead in our sins. And when you hear dead, here, show sure enough dead. We were pushing up daisies. We were six feet under. We were spiritually flatlined. The prophet Snoop Dogg would say we were dizzle for shizzle. But God, Ephesians 2, 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together in Christ. It's the idea not that I was looking for God, but my testimony is that God was looking for me and you're watching right now and you're wondering what's up with this church stuff and what's up with this Bible stuff. And I've come to tell you that before you were born, God was thinking about you. Hallelujah and planning to work his grace towards you and your life, would you receive that today? Jesus pursues you. But secondly, we learn that Jesus permeates you. Jesus permeates you. Look at verse 18. Paul says he gets saved, okay? He goes into the deserts of Arabia, and the Bible says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. Now, Paul is talking about how he gets saved. And then after three years, he goes up to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles to make sure that the gospel Christ had given him was authenticated by the gospel that Christ had given the original apostles. Translation, this is Paul's way of saying it didn't come from man so much so that I didn't even consult with Jesus' own apostles. He gave me by myself the same thing he gave them. That's the whole point of the story. But I think one of the applications we get out of this is this idea that the gospel and Jesus wants to sit in you and permeate your soul and stir up in you before he sends you out. I think that's one of the suggestions here. I want you to underline after three years. Paul is saying that there was a three year pause. Now, there was no reason to believe he was in isolation and not doing ministry. Okay. And because there were thriving cities there, it's very plausible that he was working and doing stuff. He was just doing it low key in obscurity, okay? But I want you to look at this idea and understand the importance of giving God the time to permeate your soul, giving God the time to grow you, giving God the time to teach you, giving God the time to strengthen you, to permeate you before he sends you out and what he's called you to do. One scholar said that we live in a time where there's too much emphasis on activity and accomplishment and not enough time on reflection and contemplation. Church, I want you to hang your hat there on this idea of three years. Imagine what this is like for Paul. Paul is on his way to murder Christians. Jesus saves him and says, I'm going to totally rearrange your life and I'm going to use you to just basically change the world. I'm going to deliver you, Paul. I'm going to save you, Paul. I'm going to teach you what my gospel is. I'm going to mature you. Oh, Paul, I'm going to use you. You're going to heal some people. You're going to raise a couple of folks from the dead. Oh my gosh, you're going to plant churches all over the world. Oh, and you're going to write the Bible. Like, imagine how intimidating that is to a guy who's a murderer, okay? But don't you see, this is why God probably wanted him to just slow down for three years and get filled up with all he would need for a whole lifetime of an adventure scene for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think it's a lesson that a lot of us don't want to hear, but we need to hear it today in this right now get it, blab it and grab it world, hear these words. Sometimes before God moves you, God holds you. Sometimes before God moves you, God holds you. Paul is hearing this message from Jesus saying, I got big plans for you, but first I want the gospel to permeate you. I want the gospel to mature you. I want the Bible to sit on you. I I want community and the gospel to to, to refresh you in your soul before I send you out. I'm reminded of how Jesus told the disciples after he resurrected to go wait in Jerusalem for 40 days until the power comes. And I realize that too often in Christianity, we leave Jerusalem too soon. Now, can you imagine what the church would have lost out on had Paul cheated his three years?
And some of you are watching today and you're wondering why your ministry ain't got power. You're wondering, wondering why your career is not advancing. You're wondering why your relationships aren't thriving. For some of you, you cheated on those three years. You cheated on that time where God said, I just want to Moses. I just want to, before I call you to, to get, the, get them out of Egypt, I want to sit you in Midian for a little while because right there, I want you to get strong. That's what Paul, it, God was saying to Paul. And that's what God is saying to somebody who is watching that I just want you to sit. Why? Because Paul, I think Jesus was saying to Paul that I want you to learn how to be content in obscurity so you won't try to get it out of popularity. I think Jesus was saying to Paul, I want you to learn how to have joy where there's me and the full. So you won't try to find joy when I'm when there's nothing out there in the world for you. There's something about allowing Jesus to permeate you. Jesus pursues you. Jesus permeates you. I'm reminded of a story of Rick Warren talking about how too often believers uh, cheat on their time of nourishment and cultivation to get a foundation in the gospel. And he says it's like a gardener who gardens Chinese bamboo. Chinese bamboo is, a, is an amazing kind of plant. Uh, you plant it and you nourish it and cultivate it for years and literally not even a sprout for years. And every year you nourish it and cultivate it. Year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, you're just nourishing and cultivating when nothing is growing. But then Rick says, but on the sixth year, if you've done the nourishing and the cultivation right, year six, what took six years for nothing to grow, in the sixth year, it grows 90 feet. In fact, there's documentation where Chinese bamboo has grown three feet in a 24-hour period. But if you cheat on the time of nourishing and cultivation, you're going to miss out on the time of all that fruit that you get to glean in your life. Let Jesus permeate you. He pursues, he permeates. Let's go home on this. Jesus repurposes you. Look at verses 22 and 23. Paul says, I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were here again said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. I love this verse. And they glorified God because of me. I heard one writer say that the grace of God is such that when Paul the apostle walked into the gates of heaven, the same Christians who he had martyred were the same Christians who were standing in applause as he entered into the gates of glory. The grace of Almighty God. And Paul here is testifying to the church that here's my last evidence that this gospel didn't come from anything human, it came from God. Paul is saying, if it changed me, hallelujah, it could change anybody. Underline those words, friend. In verse 23, Paul says, he who used to. When you put your trust and faith in Jesus, there ought to be a used to-ness about your testimony. Oh, you may not be where you want to be, but you ought to have a testimony. Thank God I'm not where I'm. I used to be. Anybody watching can testify that since Jesus came into my life, a wonderful change has come all over me. Now, don't hear me saying perfect. Just hear me saying that as you journey with Jesus, it ought to be a change in your life. I love what one of my mentors, Bishop Kenneth Ulmer says, before I put my trust in Jesus Christ, if you would have cut me off on the highway, I would have cussed you good. But now that I have Jesus, I cuss you way less. <laughs> Paul's not saying I'm perfect, but he's saying I'm not what, hallelujah, I used to be. And I close this sermon saying this. Paul is saying, I know that it's real. And I know that I've truly believed because I've changed. You see, friend, when you come to Christ, it ought not just to be an intellectual transformation. There ought to be actual transformation in your life. You can't put your trust in Jesus and not change. <laughs>
And Paul says, I was the guy who was trying to destroy the church. I had all this intensity, all this zeal, all this fire. But my story is that God took the same fire and the same zeal and put it in a new direction. My aunt Christola Thompson, God rest her soul, was a wonderful believer who loved sharing her testimony. And I obviously grew up in the black church and they would testify every Sunday. They would literally have open mic where you would tell a story as to God's goodness. And my aunt Chris was always one of the ones who was testifying that she was named for a distant relative named Christopher, but since she was a girl, they call her Christola because that's how we did in the South, right? I literally have an aunt Thomasine, okay? I literally have an aunt Geraldine. I literally have an aunt, um, Claudel, okay? I have an aunt, um, um, anyways, you know, I've got all these aunts. And so Christola would always tell this story of how she used to club. She says, ooh, we were club rats. And in 1940s Chicago, they went to what they called the juke joints, where they would just dance all night and get high and get drunk and just do all the things they used to do. But then a few years later, she went to a revival one night and she got saved and gave her life to Jesus. And I'll never forget talking to Aunt Chris one day about how she used to dance, but I knew her as a dancer at church. She was always dancing, dancing in the Holy Ghost, dancing in church. And I would say, but, but, but Auntie, you still dance. And she says, yeah, yeah, baby. One thing about the gospel is that Jesus will keep the dance. He'll just switch the partner. And Paul is saying, I still had the intensity. I still had the zeal. I still had the fire. Jesus just came into my life and he redirected my focus. You're watching right now and perhaps you're good at dancing, but maybe you've heard that the gospel is not based on anything human and it's based on all of God's love for you. And I would like to invite you to accept the invitation to change partners and give your life to Jesus Christ. Somebody forced you to watch this video You just happened to be scrolling on Facebook and you saw you're surfing around YouTube and maybe God in his magnificent pursuing way fixed it where you and I will be right here right now for you to consider the invitation to keep dancing, but to switch partners. All you need to do, friend, is to open up your heart and mind and say what David Ring said so many years ago and what Paul said so many hundreds of years ago, Jesus, come into my life and become the Lord of my life and save me. Forgive me of my sins, make me whole and grant that all my days I'll dance forever with you. If you pray that prayer in sincerity, the Bible says you shall be saved and you've been planted in the gospel. And if you made a commitment today, if you have any questions or any prayers that we can pray with you, there's information on screen as to how we can connect with you to let us know how we can serve you as God continues to dance in your life. Until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'll see you next time.